So let's get started with settings for welding aluminum. Now obviously you probably don't have an LCD display or anything this fancy. That's all right. This will actually still help you because you'll see the settings and it's very uh, specific on here. So just follow what I'm doing. So on this machine, because it's got a digital display, we're going to go to process. In your case, you just want to select AC TIG. However, you can do that. And we're doing high frequency start. So that's selected and we're going to go back home. So now the machine is maxed out at 210 amps. Depending on what you're welding, that might be fine. Um, if you're welding thinner aluminum, you can set it at say 120, 140, so you have better pedal resolution. But for right now, we're gonna keep it there. Now we're not gonna be running pulse, uh, which on this machine is right here. You hit this button to turn on pulse. I don't recommend using pulse on aluminum for most things. I'm not gonna get too much into that. But what we're, we're going to do is go under AC Wave. Now your machine probably just has separate buttons, which is fine. So for AC Wave, we're going to start out at very simple 100 hertz. I personally like welding from about 60 hertz to 250 or 200 hertz. Your machine uh, may not have that kind of adjustability. It might only be 60 hertz if it's an older transformer machine. If that's what you have, that's fine. Use 60 hertz. If you have any kind of adjustment, I would recommend starting at 100 hertz. So we'll start at 100 hertz. Now AC balance, which is the difference between what's called the DCEN and the DCEP part of the waveform, we're going to run at 70%. Now your machine could call it AC balance, it could call it any number of things. What you're concerned about is that you want 70% of the waveform to be on the DCEN side, the penetration side. If you have it 70% on a DCEP, the cleaning side, you're going to end up melting your tungsten and basically all the heat is going to go back to the TIG torch rather than to the metal. And the whole purpose of the cleaning is to clean the oxide layer off the surface. And I have a whole separate video on that, so to understand that better, you should watch that first. So anyways, we're at 70%. Now AC waveform, this happens to have sine triangle, soft square and square. For today, we're gonna use square wave, which modern inverters, most of them all just default at square wave. A lot of them aren't adjustable, and in that case, typically they're square wave. Older transformer machines are going to be sine wave because that's what comes out of your wall socket. So they just basically replicate that on the output. So we're going to stick with square wave. Now, if you have soft square wave, uh, the nice benefit of that is because it rounds the edge off on the slope. It, uh, I guess the best way I could describe it is it reduces the volume of the actual arc. So it's not as sharp, but we're going to use square wave because that's what most welders have. Now advanced AC, I'm not going to get into that in this video because we're not going to use it, but that allows you further adjustments on your AC. Most TIG welders don't have that, which is why I'm not going to cover it. That's a whole nother video topic. So for right now we have AC, that's one. We're set at 210 amps. We have 70% DCEN, or basically your AC balance is 70%, and we're at 100 hertz for free frequency. That is where you want to start when you're learning aluminum. Uh, like I said, if you have an older welder that's fixed for output at 60 hertz for frequency, that's fine. Start there because that's all you have. But with those settings, um, you should be able to make some pretty nice looking beads. So that's where we're starting at. Let's actually get into welding some aluminum. Let me pull up a chair here. So right now we got our pieces that we prepped and cleaned. They're pretty clean. What we're going to be doing is the simplest of exercises. We're going to end up tack welding these together. Probably something like that. Let's see if I can't get one a little bit closer to the same size. Uh, this guy looks a little... All right. Perfect. We're going to tack weld the ends of these 
and then uh, I'll show you that where we're at with that and then we're going to actually start running beads. The first bead we're going to run down the actual joint, the butt joint, um, and then we're going to go from there and we're just going to pad beads. I'm a big fan of actually welding pieces together rather than using a bigger plate because it gives you more practice of actually welding something. Set that up. Now you already saw the settings that we're at, so no need to discuss that. Got our TIG torch, the tungsten. One thing I really like doing is I'm going to take a piece of aluminum and just strike an arc and run a puddle really quick just to make sure that everything's good, like the gas flow is working, so you don't start welding on this and then like, oh shit, I forgot to turn the gas on. Alrighty, everything looks pretty good. So we know we got gas coverage, that's all good. Let's uh, start tack welding these together. Now we got these things tacked up. You can see you left kind of a little bit of a crater on that guy. You wanna definitely avoid that on a tack because if this thing was stressed at all or bent, it would just crack right there. Now we're not gonna have much burn through on the back. I definitely could have ran it hot enough to get uh, fusion on the backside, but we're just doing practice here. And I'm trying to keep the backside somewhat clean because that way you can weld both sides of it and focus on the quality of your beads not so much penetration uh, that's consistent at this point. So we got it tacked up. Now, a lot of people will struggle with tacking. And for me, when I was learning aluminum and DC TIG, I really had a terrible time tack welding pieces. I don't know why, but like on a fillet weld, trying to tack the corners, I, I could run a perfect looking bead, but tacking corners, I would just always melt it away. And that was actually harder than most things. So what I kind of figured out, especially with aluminum, as I bring the tungsten close, I essentially will strike the arc, let it sit there, slowly increase amperage, move it around just a little bit. And what I'm really looking at is for both edges, to, I'll see a little corner of the edge start melting. If you only see one side of it melting, try and bring the arc over to the other side. At lower amperage, the AC arc will tend to pick a, one or the other side. It picks a side. As you slowly increase it and bring the tungsten close to each side, it eventually will start melting both corners. When you see both corners melting, slightly increase the amperage, bring your filler rod close, and then dab it in there and then increase the amperage as well. So when it takes a little bit of practice, but when you get used to it, uh, it's really not that hard. It's definitely harder on AC with aluminum than it is DC, but that gives you a pretty good idea of where to start. So now that we have this tacked up, um, I'm gonna run a couple beads on this and then we're gonna look at them and talk about it. Uh, another thing worth noting here, so this tungsten, I'm gonna loosen it here. I can't push it in any further because this back cap is not long enough, okay? And this is a brand new tungsten. And I want you to look at something here. You see all of that blue color? That's all oxides. Now, the reason you're seeing that is because the gas coverage on this is not really good enough. And if you look at the stick out there, it's pretty far stuck out. And there's not a whole lot I can do about this besides switching to shorter tungsten I can also increase the gas flow. I can run a longer cup rather than this stubby lens. Um, realistically, what I'm gonna do is increase the gas flow a little bit and it should be all right. I generally prefer a shorter tungsten stick out on aluminum, it's just unfortunately I can't with this gas lens. So I'm gonna up my argon flow and then uh, we're gonna weld and we should see uh, less of that. Um, right now I'm running like I think 12 or 14 CFM on gas and I want to go up to probably 16 or so and actually I got to go strike the pedal here 
All right, for some reason, when I struck the arc, it killed out the audio, so I'm just going to kind of voice dub over this. But I adjusted the argon flow a little bit higher to help protect the tungsten a little bit more. And ultimately that seemed to work, which is what I was looking at is you don't want your tungsten to oxide because the arc stability and control is going to be by far worse. So I'm pretty much setting up to weld here. Got the pieces all ready. And I'm just going to run a couple passes on this and we're going to take a look at it close up on the camera and see where things are at. In the future, I'm going to get an art camera to where I can actually do close-ups where you can see what's going on. But for the time being, this is the pest you guys got to deal with. And I'm initiating the arc right here. As soon as I see that puddle establish the width I want, then I start dabbing and moving. Amperage-wise, I would say I'm approximately at uh, probably 150 to 160 amps. All right, let's take a look here at what we got. If we look here, overall the width of it is pretty consistent. And you see the start, not the best start, but not bad, but very straight, very consistent. The end of the weld, uh, small crater overall, not too bad. But this is kind of what you want to be aiming for. It's just consistency. Now here near the end, you can see how it's a little bit wider and it's a little duller. That's because it got hotter and therefore the penetration went through more. And that was because the plate was warping on the table there and it didn't have a metal backing to it at that point, which is why it's hotter. But overall, uh, pretty consistent here. And let's take a look at the backside here um, and see if we have penetration or not through it. As suspected, uh, very little at the start here, and which I expected. I wasn't running that hot at the start, and that's okay. And you can definitely see there's enough heat to warp it, but definitely not enough heat to penetrate all the way through, which the material is roughly eighth inch thick. So at the amperage we're running, we wouldn't expect it. And again, you know, the middle of it, no penetration. And then as we get closer to the end, we're we can visually see it's flatter, we see that we have full penetration and going all the way to the end. And that's like visually, you can tell just by looking at an aluminum weld whether or not it penetrated. And when you see a wider flat weld like that, um, you know that you're getting through the back side versus most of the weld was run on a colder side which, like I said, this is practice of running beads straight and equal width and height on plates, so we're not aiming to get absolute consistent penetration. This is just a kind of introductory practice exercise. Well, let's get set up and uh, run some more beads then. Definitely won't, don't want to grab that barehanded. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at what we got here after I ran another pass on that. Now, if you look at it, uh, our start is a little bit better, but it kind of blew up. Uh, there must have been a contaminant or something on the edge. I'm not really sure, but kind of the puddle puffed up and there's little BBs there. Fortunately, after that point, it welded real clean. So I'm not too worried about that, but you can have that, you know, it really stresses importance of having a clean uh, material. So anyways, I ran a pretty consistent bead, equal width, equal height, overall really good there. Um, the end of the weld has far less of a crater than the previous one. Uh, again, in film with this camera, everything looks a lot worse than it really is. So overall, not too bad there. 
Uh, this bead is a little bit on the colder side, so we're definitely not going to see virtually any penetration through the back, even here at the end where I started tapering off. And let's take a look here. Yeah, you can, you can see here there's virtually nothing new that wasn't on the, from the previous weld. So overall, uh, what I expected. But overall, again, we're looking pretty good. Starting to warp the plate a little bit due to the heat input and the weld shrinking. But since it's aluminum, it flexes back pretty easy. If this was stainless, it would be a lot worse of a situation there. But uh, now I'm going to start welding. And we're going to weld down that other seam and go from there. Now I left this blooper in here because that's kind of the whole point of my channel is making mistakes and how to fix them. So this was warped pretty bad there as I showed you earlier. And as soon as I liquefied that tack, essentially the plates just popped. And in the process of them popping, my tungsten got dipped and now I'm going to have to clean up the plates and regrind the tungsten so it actually welds properly. But uh, yeah, mistakes happen. All right, after that little bit of a mistake, um, I re-tacked it. So I cut the broke tack out, cleaned it up a little bit, bent the plates a little flatter, and then re-tacked it. And a little bit stronger of a tack. But uh, what happened there is that because this section was warped so much and this wasn't welded yet, uh, as soon as that tack liquefied, it basically popped. So not a big deal. Now it won't that we retacked it and uh, I'm going to start here and weld over to that side and we're going to take a look at what I got. Now this weld I can tell you already is going to be on the colder side simply because of how it looks. If you look at it it's somewhat roped up um, we're not going to see virtually any penetration through the back, and like I said, we're not really aiming for that. So we got a decent uh, start on this, on the tack. Uh, ran a nice weld that's very consistent in width and height. And then our finish uh, doesn't have very much of a crater at all, which is good. We don't want craters there. So overall, that's not too bad. Um, our cathodic etch zone, the white area, is pretty wide. And that has a lot to do with the fact that I'm running a number seven or eight cup and a fair amount of gas flow. If I lowered the flow and used a smaller cup, uh, that etch zone would be a lot thinner. And you mainly see that as distinct on here is because the aluminum is also very clean. And if we look at the backside, as I predicted, there's no reinforcement or penetration through, which again, that's not the purpose of the exercise. So now that we have these three pieces fused, uh, I'm just going to run a bunch more beads on this and then we'll take a look at it and probably finish up the video. So I just finished two welds as you saw me. Plate's pretty damn hot right now. And you look at it uh, overall, again, same stuff that we're aiming for. Very straight welds, consistent in width and height. Minimal craters, decent starts. You can definitely see there it got a little hotter, the bead got a little flatter. We're not going to see virtually any penetration through the back. I mean, a little bit right there, but not really too much there. Looking pretty good overall. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue welding this out, and I'll put a pick at the end of this video to show you that. But overall, doing good. Keep, keep doing this yourself. Do a couple practice plates. You'll get a hang of it. If you have any questions, get a hold of me. Otherwise, go build something. Thanks.